Um, so just as, as we're waiting for Nathaniel, uh, thank you all for those of you who've gotten songs uploaded over the weekend. There's like a lot of beautiful stuff that you guys are already doing in class. So just keep that stuff coming in. And then you have, you know, uh, what is it? Challenge three of the Patterson exercises. I just uploaded an assignment um, uh, place for you to turn that in um, for this Saturday this week. And I made a couple of videos about production stuff this week. The second video deals with um, really heavily with uh, Esme Patterson's first record, which is which I produced. Um, and so you might you can look up on YouTube. You might listen to the whole record if you feel like it. Um, it might sound better to listen in headphones um, to hear some of the the distinctions between things um, rather than just going off of our normal computer speakers. Um, uh, but of course, I only do that <laughs> to talk about things that I've worked on because I can talk about the process itself. Um, so you don't need to love the product or anything. <clears throat> Any questions while we're waiting for Nathaniel? Um, I actually had a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for the I mean, I know I already turned it in and I, I responded to four different people for the original song workshop. Huh. Um, I did get notifications for a peer review for four students, but I had already done four separate comments yeah. um, just for people. Should I additionally do those? Um, no, ones if, you've, if you've already done the four, then that's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, the, we've had lots of classes have had trouble with the peer review stuff um just uh sometimes the button works and sometimes it doesn't mm -hmm. so sometimes i go in i go in and i make sure afterwards that i click it again um but if you know if all of our stuff is in one big open thing so people can see each other's comments it's fine okay thank um, you jeff blair is here Gonna text Nathaniel, who confirmed last night, so I'm not too worried about it. Kennedy, when you are. And for those of you who already posted stuff, I, I think Dominic posted one late, but Dominic spent a lot of time on his song. There's, it's like really, there's a lot of production. Um, there's another chat person here. Oh, and Deja, here comes Deja. Um, another thing is, I, I, so just uh, as we're um, looking towards the next couple of weeks, um, next week we have Kitty Crimes, um, or also Maria Kohler is <laughs> her given name. Um, and so she's, the, I, I played one of her videos in the um, production um, lecture videos this week. Um, but you might check out a lot more of her stuff. She's got tons of stuff and she's working in hip hop and pop. Um, and she also does um, beats and production work for other people. Um, and um, I don't know if, if it's something that you're looking for, it's something you might want to ask her. Um, Nathaniel says, be right here. He'll be right here. Um, uh, um, yeah, so she might check it out. And then this guy, Jeff Linsenmeyer, who's coming in in two weeks, he's like the drum tech right now for some like super like big country acts. Like, I don't know if it's Kenny Chesney or who, who he's working with right now. He's living in Nashville. Um, his own project is called Dust on the Breakers, but he did all of the backup, like the auxiliary instruments for the fray for a long time. And uh, he was in Woven Hand for a long time as a drummer. Um, uh, and Munley as a drummer way back in, in time and a band with me as a drummer. So um, 
uh, Jeff Lentenmeyer has been like he like knows you too. <laughs> these, like this is his life is like the biggest of the big stars, which is funny. Um, so he's going to talk about um, his his life in music, and he, he's currently, you know, everybody has downtime right now, and he's currently making a a new rec- a new record of his own. Um, so that's what we have for the next few weeks, and then I'll keep letting you know. Um, this might be Nathaniel now. Um, is that you, Nathaniel? Me, Roger, Ron. Oh, it's Ron Miles. Okay. <laughs> it just says hey, MS16724. So I don't know what, I don't know how to make pictures show up or anything, but I thank you for letting me know that this is happening. I'm sorry, yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nathaniel just texted. He says he'll be right here. Um. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, Kitty Crimes, like for next week, that she's, the videos are really great and the lyrics are great and her own production is really, really, really great. And there aren't like a lot of people in Denver that are working heavily in pop and in hip hop in the way that she's doing it. Um, so I'm really excited that Maria is coming. Oh, and then for some, I mean, I know Nathaniel's going to pop in here any second, but um, for some of you in songwriting and in, in production comments on your songs, um, I keep referring to this um, Brian Eno little box called Oblique Strategies. And um, it's just cards. So if I've pulled cards for you for suggestions for your songs, here comes Nathaniel. It's, it's, it's just cards that look like this kind of stuff, like where it says, try faking it. One element of each kind. So you just kind of randomly pull the cards. Um, and let's see. Hey, Roger. Hey, Nathan. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I was just showing. Sorry about that. I didn't get it to work for whatever reason on my other device. So I'm just on my phone here. Apologies. But <laughs> that's okay. Can what you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Good to see your face. Um, <clears throat> Same as always. Um, yeah, I was just telling students about um, Brian Eno's oblique strategy cards for the studio. Um, so if I put those in, in your comments, I'm just pulling random cards. Um, okay. For, that. <laughs> for for students turned in a bunch of uh, songs this weekend. So, um, so right. this is Nathaniel Rateliff, and um, we know how things go here. It's pretty much an informal chat. Although Nathaniel and I talked a few weeks ago about the fact that you're just starting another record, right? And or you uh, last week. Um, I was supposed to, but there's been. Um, um, I've been remodeling the house and so it's been pretty chaotic. So I keep pushing it back. So I'm actually not starting until the 19th, but I've been kind of doing my own pre-production, even though the date keeps getting pushed back, which is, um, you know, I tend to, uh, I, I, I kind of tend to like kind of come up with a lot of stuff, whether it be like voice memos um, or even demos that I kind of go through. And then like, even here, like stuff I've write, written down, which took me a long time to figure this out is just to write what you're working on on the outside of your notebook. <laughs> Cause I don't ever, I don't ever type. I just still like to handwrite everything. But so I've been, like I said, kind of doing my own pre-production and listening to my demos and then kind of sort through various um, ridiculous voice memos because they can be Sometimes you find gems, and then sometimes you'll find a voice memo that's just like, bing, 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 bing. and then you're like, why did I record that? You know. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And then with some of the demos, um, recently my friend who's going to produce our record, Eli Thompson, who was friends with our previous producer Richard Swift, who passed. Um, <clears throat> 
we were just kind of jamming as a four piece with that. It was like me and him. And so he was kind of playing bass and then a different friend was playing drums who doesn't normally play drums in the night sweats. And then the drummer was playing keys, but we just kind of were hanging out playing. But then as we were playing, we're recording and just sort of discussing like a lot of older um, R and B and rhythm and blues stuff. There seems to be this reoccurring thing where it's like uh, just jamming on a theme. Like a good example of that is um, a Sly and the Family Stone. Um, everyday people is one chord. Mm -hmm. So we we're kind of coming up with like pretty simple progressions that had A and B parts. And then I would just do sort of stream of conscious um, ad libbing over top of that words and melody and then call out changes as I saw fit. Um, <clears throat> and so now I go back through and I kind of see what I have written in a way that is sort of stream of conscious and then see if I can make sense out of some of that stuff. Cause sometimes you have phrases like you really surprise yourself. If you write that way, it'll just kind of come out or at least it happens for me that way. So, yeah. Hmm. That's super interesting. <laughs> is that where, is that too much information? No, 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 that's great information. <laughs> that's great. So you're using, you're kind of using the, the group setup as the writing situation for, for you. Right. Which also sometimes in that capacity, we've even done it in the previous records um, where I don't have everything written um, lyric wise, but have a, a good sense of what the melody should be. Um, and you just sort of like jam together live, which there's always such a good feeling when that happens. And there's also this thing I feel that happens when you're writing something as you're discovering it. It there's this like kind of excitement that never happens again. Yeah. You know, it's like the first time you make out with somebody, you're like, I can't believe this is happening. You know, mm -hmm. um, sorry, that's a horrible analogy, but you know what I mean? Like it always seems I'm always surprised by the process, I guess, of, or like surprised that a melody comes out or of myself or, or even lyrics. So yeah, I, I kind of, and, and yeah, it's just like this weird excitement um, that, yeah. So I don't know if anybody else feels that way when they're writing, but in the group here, so. Yeah. And you guys feel free to just jump in and ask Nathaniel questions. Cause yeah, I can't, I don't, I don't see any comments. So if there's anybody that just wants to like, um, yeah, that, you know, that's fine. Hi, sorry. I wanted to ask you something right away because I was like, oh, what? It's Nathaniel. By the way, I love your music. Thank you. Yes. Um, but I had a question about, so the stories, since I'm from Denver, the stories of like so many artists that I know, a lot of musicians a little bit older than me are always like, yeah, like I've, I've, I've seen Nathaniel, you know, here and here and here, just like him and his guitar. And then all of a sudden now you're hearing Nathaniel, you know, touring, you know, practice, I'm assuming all over the world. Um, and so was that, was that like pretty quick for you or was it, I mean, obviously you were hustling cause you were with you and a guitar. Right. But all of a sudden it's like, there's this gap of the story of Nathaniel and then holy shit. Now he's all the way up here, you know? Well, yeah, that's the funny thing about that story is that it, you know, and I was always, you know, around, especially in Baker, because I lived there for almost 15 years. So you saw like these clubs kind of start up that helped shape the scene in Denver, like the High Dive and Larimer Lounge. And High Dive was just a place that I was always at because it was a half a block from my house. But in reality, I feel like there's probably about 20 years of me really working really hard. Um, and, and no, you know, and like kind of, yeah, just playing with me and a guitar or or a band or multiple bands and then you know finally I put out the Night Sweats record which was sort of a uh, sort of a last try at um, really pursuing music as a as a full-time profession mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of got lucky and then from then on I was actually talking to L King about this who's a singer-songwriter and we kind of our both of us she had a song that really took off at the same time that sob did and you know what happens is like you work and work and work for so many years 
and then you start to make it quote unquote and then right. and then all of a sudden there is so much work you know i think the first uh two years we were doing close to 200 shows a year wow. um you know and sometimes those are like three performances a day or more you know pretty and then like just crazy travel so you think once you really start to make it that you've made it but then it's really only the beginning to the amount of work you have to put in to sustain everything um right. and and even now it's like you know there's a lot of us so the, the, our primary income is is touring which right now is not a possibility um just because there's you know you know it's not the 90s you're not making cds that cost you 18 cents and selling them for 18 dollars um music is free um and you know your spotify checks you know for over a million plays is still like 175 dollars or something you know what i mean where if you if you think about the what was happening in the 90s and early 2000s and just how much it's changed since in the industry that um you know you're making grips of money just because of the amount of physical merchandise you're selling um but yeah so I, that's a long answer i apologize but um yeah no, i mean that that was kind of the thing but i, I guess to finally answer for real um <laughs> it, it wasn't really like um you know i, I guess the overnight su success took like 20 years or more right make it. right so. No, that's awesome. How have is there anything that you've been thinking of since COVID happened? Like shit, you know, these are things that take away your shows. Is there other avenues that you've been looking through? Um, I'm a little reluctant to do a lot of the Zoom stuff, and right. I've done some of that privately or for um, organizations or things that I I feel like I want to align myself with. There's um, yeah, you did one for like Boys and Girls Club, right? Yep. Um, yeah, I saw that. And then I've also, you know, we did stuff with Farm Aid. Um, we did a fundraiser um, for just band and crew, um, bands and crews in Colorado. Um, so all that kind of stuff. Um, but primarily, I've just been kind of, you know, I, I don't really know what to do. Um, the Zoom stuff to me, um, I think the thing that bothers me a little bit about our shift in culture and, and technology is there is no mystery anymore. There is no secrets to how records are made. And, you know, everybody, like, even when you do like an EPK for a record, which is a electronic press kit, which is something I loathe every time I have to do it because you basically, it's like every record, you know, on a major label scale, they usually want some sort of, um, you know, new story that's basically your old story being retold, like a new introduction um, to what you're doing. And that's just tiresome to me. And then I feel like it, um, if I don't like doing it, it sort of like kind of takes away from who I am as a person and is more of a distraction than it is a way to introduce myself to people better. Um, yeah. And it just, you know, uh, I like the mystery. I, you know, like, you know, you didn't hear Leonard Cohen talk about what he wrote those songs about for, you know, almost 40 years until like literature came out later in his life. You never heard the stories of, I mean, you heard rumor, but you didn't know that like, hallelujah, you know, that like, or that he didn't appreciate his songs or what they're about. Like, and so it, it leaves the listener or the reader um, the opportunity to make their own connection with what the, the words are about. And I think that's the one thing that I love about music, which kind of gets taken away from techno which te technology sort of robs us is that, um, you know, like I like to write, I write songs that have a lot to do with my world experience, my life experience, but I like to try to write in a way that it presents itself to the listener to place themselves in those situations where you're singing and writing about things that hopefully we all feel as humans and as a part of the human experience. And to explain that to everyone, be like, 
well, that line is actually just like, uh, well, for example, I wrote this song called Mavis off of the last record. And one of the, or not Mavis, uh, sorry, Tonight Number Two, which I kind of wrote as a tongue in cheek thing, trying to make myself, I thought I was being very clever. And one of the lines in there, which my girlfriend thought was just like amazing. She was just like, <laughs> she was like, I think I say, well, tonight your eyes are, your eyes are just crazy or your eyes are crazy, which to me, I was laughing like to myself when I wrote it, thinking of like looking at somebody being like, man, your eyes are fucking crazy right now. You look insane. <laughs> but she thought it was like, you know, it's like beautiful, like, oh, tonight, well, your eyes are crazy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's kind of the bummer. And then when I told her, I was like, no, I mean, it's like, you know, you're like, you're crazy. She was like, oh, that really ruins it. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> see you night. So yeah, sorry, yeah. another long explanation, but. No, that's <laughs> awesome. I definitely relate. I'm, I'm having a hard time. And some people are thriving off of it, which I think is great. And it's fun to watch that. And it's fun to see certain careers kind of come out of that. But I'm definitely on the other end of like that human experience is kind of why I started it in the first place. Right. So it's it's definitely taken a hit on my, on like, what do I do? Like, what do I do with my hands? You know, like, <laughs> it's kind of where I'm at right now. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And I think writing, you know, like I said, if, if I try to write, um, so it's perceived by other people to be like, to be able to insert their own stories. Um, it kind of took me a long time to get there my my real approach is still always to try to write something that i like and that i connect with mm. if, you're, if you're writing outside of that um then like I, I don't know if you're serving the song or if you're serving yourself and i think the goal in the art form in my opinion is to always serve the song mm. to try to get out of the way of what the song wants to do and listen even when it comes to arrangement you know, and, and that can be tough when you're working with eight to 10 people um, and every individual has an idea. And if their idea gets kind of squashed, their feelings can get hurt. Mm -hmm. But that has to be known when you're working together that to serve the song is is the main thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I guess um, going, Devin mentioned like, you know, you um, came out with SOB about like five years ago now, I guess, right. but like you went from like, you know, I, I heard your name. I had never seen live call because like, I, I'm pretty young. So I was probably, you know, teenager wasn't going out <laughs> to the clubs right. uh, seeing at Larimer Lounge yet. But um, how was it like to like go from playing at the high dive in Larimer Lounge to then being booked for Red Rocks um, in the live setting of like playing? Well, each, you know, I feel like each step um, is, I don't know, you've got to you prepare yourself for the unknown. And I always approached like our first show at Red Rocks. Um, we had worked our asses off up to that point. Um, and I try to look at it as if like, it may never happen again and not that, you know, um, but, but each one of those steps was, um, I don't know. Sometimes it was scary. Sometimes I was too drunk to, to know, to notice that the change was happening. And, and that was, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it is, it's something that kind of comes with the territory and it's really dangerous. Um, because you end up like kind of getting lost in that and 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 then you don't really appreciate what's actually happening and so uh, unfortunately um there's a lot of things uh, a lot of people i've met a lot of situations that i was in that i really wish i had better memories of but um some of that was we just we were so excited about what was happening and we didn't know how to handle the workload and um and, and, and I remember, you know, being in the Netherlands and we had no idea and, uh, there we we're going to play this festival. And the festival season's going to be kind of rough because you never know what kind of audience you're going to have. 
it could be nobody. And in the beginning, people were throwing beers at us when we would sing SOB because they thought they were cheering us on. Oh. Which, you know, when you have a bunch of electronic Dang. equipment on stage, it's not very fun. Um, yeah. So I remember playing this festival and we didn't realize it, but in the Netherlands, I Need Never Get Old was the second most listened to song in the country. So we're going to play the biggest festival. We're all very hungover. And we walk out on the stage like, all right, let's just, it's like a festival set. We can just plow through this. And then we get out on the stage and there's 65,000 people who are excited, ecstatic. Oh, with us. Um, you know, and that's one of those moments where you're like, oh my God, we have to like pull it together right now. And I think a lot of those situations as we were growing, we didn't know what the audience was gonna be. And you walk out on the stage and the energy from the crowd um, sort of puts you into autopilot mode and you just, you know, you work as hard as you can. You're throwing yourself around trying to get people into it and, you know, jumping off the stage or whatever to try to like, match the energy of the audience um but yeah it was it, like it was a very interesting thing for it to continue to grow um and like by the time we got to red rocks um you know that was a year's worth of work um so yeah it was it was kind of crazy so <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know if that answered the question no, kind of i mean i was just yeah i won't um, wondering like, cause that's two different settings and two different ways, you know, play live, you know, so I was just. It, it is, crazy. but I, I kind of, I always like to approach a big audience. Like we were playing in a room of 150 people and we're like shoulder to shoulder with everybody. Yeah. Um, it, with a bigger audience, um, I feel like I've always said this, like over a thousand people, you're starting to deal with a mob. You don't have an audience so how do you control the mob how do you get the mob excited like how do you get that a large mass of people to listen to you um you know that, because there's so much noise of just like even a thousand people just talking quietly is is a lot to talk over um but i still like i said you try to approach it the same way you would if you were playing a dive bar for for 150 people or for 50 people you know and uh just like you want all those people to leave feeling like that was the best thing i ever saw you know yeah yeah <laughs> i guess i have one more question if i um so um roger gave us some stuff to listen to before you know we got to talk to you and it was one of them was a podcast you did with uh the um New York public radio about it's all right. And you're talking about, I guess, how your process has changed from when you're doing um, one um, from, I guess, five years ago with your struggle with alcoholism, but you're right. not like your, how, how's your process changed from when you were maybe drinking in the studio, um, produce, making music kind of in that more party setting to, um, right. to maybe a different knowing the cons like, you're talking about the consequences and that you right. try to move away from that type of thing. Right. And, you know, um, for the first record, you know, when I, I guess to clarify that my, uh, even with my struggle in drinking, whenever I really sit down to write is usually in a, a time span where I will, won't drink at all or will only have very little at the end of the night. Um, but I don't feel that I, I'm very productive um under the influence of any substance um even with like pot i think like sometimes i'll have like i'll noodle and play my instruments for hours and maybe come up with an idea but it's usually pretty loose and i never i don't tend to finish a lot of stuff um but i can come i can generate i can generate ideas but not finish so um but yeah i think more and more um as, as I continue to like, you know, just continue to write and, and, you know, getting started as a musician is one thing, but then sustaining myself and everyone involved, um, 
there's a huge pressure to that, you know, like, because then it's also like, what are you writing? What are you doing? Um, and, and one of the things that only, you know, I think when you're drinking or using drugs a lot, it's, it's not sustainable. Um, and, you know, I've, I've certainly lost friends and people I cared about already in my life because of substance um, and thought that maybe I would go out that same way. So it's, it's always a challenge because, because of the industry, you know, like even on a smaller level, um, when you're touring, you'll always get free liquor or booze, uh, but you won't, you don't always necessarily get free food, you know? Um, and so it's kind of hard to shape like what you want to feel like every day. And that should be your focus is like, how good do I want to feel? And how bad am I going to feel if I don't sleep and I drink and then I have to eat speed to play this show tomorrow? So, you know, that sounds kind of lame, but <laughs> but that's sort of me being pretty brutally honest, unfortunately. No apologies, but yeah. So, uh, it's all good. But yeah, I think, um, you know, I feel like there's some things as far as my process goes that it's kind of still stayed the same. Like I always write mostly sober and, you know, with the first record I had had everything written. So it was mostly just going back in and recreating the demos with Richard Swift, the way I wanted them to be and the way he saw them to be and just trying to get it done before we got too drunk. So, which would usually, we probably worked about four hours a day. He also, Kevin Morby, who's a good friend of mine, who Richard also did City Music. And Kevin was telling me recently that Richard called him and he's like, okay, man. He's like, I don't want you to be like a puss about this, but I'm only going to work four hours a day and we're going to make your record that way. Which I guess bending to the will of a producer is, can be kind of difficult. <laughs> but Richard had extraordinary talent and was able to actually make a record only recording four hours a day so but i wouldn't suggest that anybody else try that so yeah it's all Roger, i got doing okay or like the, yeah, yeah everything's great um um i wondered what since you just talked about richard swift um and you already brought up sly and the family stone um there is this intentional um kind of retro look going on in your work and and is that does that inform your writing process or is it something that sort of comes after the fact when you're building things in the studio how um i think um well it's funny richard and sly and the family stone the reference to sly and the family stone is actually richard for a while was writing one song a day and from listening to that everyday people song he was like, man, this is one chord. I can do that. And he wrote Lady Luck, which is Richard's kind of only hit, mm -hmm. which is kind of a ripoff of that song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that Probably was sort thinking of like song. Diana Ross or something. <laughs> like he sounds yeah, like. right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and, and I guess um, in, in the start of the Night Sweats, my whole idea was to like put together Together. Um, and so I, because I kept, I just wanted to hear this like kind of rock and roll rhythm and blues sound, which is something I just don't hear that much. So yeah, I do kind of reference back to older stuff. And um, I do a lot of, you know, I, one of the fun things in the studio is to actually take a break sometimes and listen to like 45s and records in our particular style. Uh, especially with the night sweats, I feel like the night sweats are a certain thing. So I try to write in that genre, but then continue to push outside of what I feel they are without like, without uh, pushing my audience too far, if that makes sense. Like, cause I feel like there's an expectation for what we should sound like. And I want to, you know, kind of continue to give people that, but then slightly change it or, or vary it. Like some of the stuff I've been working on now sounds a little more like Bill Withers because I also think about like, how is this album going to contribute to a live setting of two albums or 
a little over two albums worth of material that we already have, like what five to seven songs are going to come off of this record that we can insert into a new show that makes it a better, you know, um, 90 minute or 120 minute long set, you know, but it is definitely, yeah, I, I like the, the way music used to sound. I like the approach of recording that way, like more analog, um, not a lot of tricks, like go in there and play your part, you know, sing your part. Um, don't augment your voice um, with pitch, just like, yeah, I don't know, but that, you know, that's kind of my, what I loved about the band is there were a bunch of guys that had very unique voices that all sang together. And that's kind of what I wanted with the Night Sweats as well, is to have like a sort of male singing group. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but, yeah. So. Um, going into, so, so yesterday I was watching Fargo season three, I, mm -hmm. I just started it. And at the end of the first episode, SOB, uh, plays to finish off the episode. Um, when it comes to royalties, uh, how, how, do, how is that, that process? Like, how was it for you? Um, just like. Was, was it something that you had to bring to other people to convince them to put into your into their their pro products or was it something where they found your song and and got in contact with you um it's kind of a mixture of both you know for years as a solo artist i always thought that the stuff that i was writing um felt very thematic and would lend itself to um you know, film, and then I also did compose music for commercials and and movies as like a way to just sustain myself for a long time. Um, but it's hard to shop your own music. At least I found it difficult. Um, I know there's third party groups that connect people now, even on a on different levels of um, success. Uh, but I think what happened for us is the record did well, and then all of a sudden we became a name that people are familiar with. And then so a lot of the people that are doing licensing for film and TV sometimes are just music fans. That's how they get the job. And they'll be like, oh, we should use this song. Um, but then there is also a team of people at the label, and you sometimes hire out outside sources to try to get to get more of those sinks as they call them. Um, but you know, the more people you hire, the more percentage of that sink is taken away. And as far as mechanicals go, um, you know, like whatever I would make off of that TV show, um, the label, the label and, um, and publishing would get 50% of that to pay back royalty advances which there in turn also like in advance can be great because it's something you don't have to pay back necessarily. But I would always err on the side of owning your own rights and your masters in the long run will benefit you. But then it's also hard to get your stuff placed and hard to get sinks if you don't have that assistance. But as we've gone along and we'll continue to make records that do well, and we go to renegotiate, like I just had to renegotiate for three more records with the label. Um, and they actually are kind of saving me and the band from going totally tits up during COVID um, from those advances. Um, <clears throat> but then I have to pay that back before I see any real royalties, you know. So it's kind of a, you know, one of those games, um, but, but I guess overall, it, even if it's a wash, it benefits you down the road. You know? Does that make sense or is that? Because <laughs> uh, I, I feel like it's a hard answer. It's a hard question to answer because it's really, um, it, it really just depends on, you know, like use Billy Ellish as an example. Like you can make a record in your closet and put it out. And if they didn't have much, like, if her and Phineas still own that stuff, 
they'll be so so damn rich you know um that's a i don't know it's also like the goal of making a lot of money off of playing music is it's pretty difficult like i said i had 20 years of like you know living in a van essentially you know, and i i didn't buy a house until two years ago so yeah. and i'm i'll be 42 um day after tomorrow so yeah but that's kind of how i play my cards i guess so sorry the yapping too much <laughs> oh i i appreciate it and happy early birthday thanks man appreciate it <laughs> Yeah, Nathaniel, I had a question. You're from St. Louis, correct? Uh, just just west of there, actually, yeah. Oh, right on. How long did you stay in that area? Uh, I mean, I grew up there, and I left in 98 when I was uh, 18. So. Oh, right and on. Then, and yourself, are you from that area? Or? Yeah, so I'm from St. Louis, too. Originally, I was born in Norman, Illinois, but then I moved there when I was about, like, seven to eight years old and lived there for about a decade and then moved out when I was 18 to – where I'm at right now in Arvada, Colorado. Um, so I actually moved to Arvada when I left too. Yeah, there we go. Where were like where specifically in St. Louis? Were you west of St. Louis? I, I was in a little town called Herman, actually. Oh, Herman! Yeah, I know where Herman's at. Yeah, I was in Eureka, yeah. Missouri. Eureka, okay, Wisconsin. I know where Eureka's yeah. at. Yeah, yeah, right before <laughs> Pacific and uh, House. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, what made you? Were Were you pursuing music at all before you left? St. Louis? I was. I, 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 I kind of grew up playing. Like I started playing drums when I was seven and played in church. Uh, and then I had a band with Joseph Pope who still plays with me now. He's a bass player in, in this band, in the Night Sweats. Um, so yeah, we played together for years and moved out here together. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, um, and then uh, kind of as we established ourselves out here, we, we didn't really know where to play and, and it kind of took us a while to figure out what the scene was. And we kind of missed, there was a pretty cool warehouse scene back in the day. Um, and a lot of cool bands uh, came out of that um, in the early 2000s. Um, but we weren't really a part of that. It wasn't until really the high dive opened up kind of in our neighborhood that it worked out so well for us so oh right on right on would you say there was like a a huge like push musically to make you come out here or were there other circumstances that made you want to come to denver outside of st louis or what was that kind of reasoning behind that well um since i had already worked at the same plastic factory twice in herman and i had no high school education um i didn't really have a whole lot of options and i came out here um, originally for to join this religious organization non-denominational religious organization that's supposed to do missionary work and found myself doing things that I like like working with homeless or, or the unhoused and um, I did a lot of work with the Hopi Native Americans but I've always been so interested in Native American culture and religion and ideology that um, when I started to work with the Hopis, I, I was no longer a, uh, a Christian. So, and then I quickly found out that I, I just kind of started to see the dogma and in, in religion in general. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I kind of separated myself from that and then just continued to study history and things that I enjoyed. But then once I, once I was here, like I said, there was no opportunity for me back in Missouri and I just so happened to get a job at a trucking company and without a high school education, I was making $21 an hour and that was probably as good as it was gonna get for me, so, yeah. Right on, right on. Well, so then I kind of got stuck and, and you get used to the no humidity and bugs and all that stuff, so, yeah. Yeah, 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 I'd rather be here in the Missouri, weather and other reasons, but yeah. Yeah, it's a little stuck. I, I, miss, I miss some of the folks back there, but. Yeah, it is what it is. So. Right on. Awesome. Okay. Um, you said you grew up in church. Does, like, I guess when I think I, I grew up in church, but, like, I think of singing hymnals a lot and just a certain type of music, especially, you know, in, um, I guess in the 2000s and, um, well, for you, like, the 90s. And, um, but does that still affect your music or do you think you're kind of moved past that, just that early introduction to music? Um, 
Well, like in, in my church, my mom was like the, the band leader and she wrote a lot of her own stuff, but it was very sort of like 70s folk. You know, she was a big James Taylor fan and Jim Croce. So I think there was a lot of times when people, especially when the Night Sweats first came out, they'd be like, oh, you grew up listening to like gospel. And I was like, no, 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 no. It was like very different. I like what my mom played was very different than what I, like when I heard the Soul Stirrers and, um, you know, the Staple Singers, like that really turned me on. And I dug through all of that, um, you know, with such excitement. Um, just to hear the way they, those people sang together, um, to hear that music, to hear those songs. So that influenced me, but it wasn't necessarily what I was actually growing up hearing in church. I think I just happened to be a kid who loved doo-wop and, um, <laughs> yeah, and soul and early R&B and, and early religious recordings. So, so it was kind of like me doing my own homework where... Um, I guess the one thing that I did get from church is it was my first experience of playing music. And when the feeling of everyone singing together can be really powerful. And, and I still, that's still one of my favorite things. And I, I wish more people sang um, for the sake of singing, not, not for any, um, it, 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 it bums me out that people only sing because they feel that, um, they have a good voice or they can't sing because they don't have a good voice. Everyone used to sing. And I think I, I wish it was more like that with, without any sort of stipulations on the quality of your voice um, because people raising their voices together is really powerful. I feel. So. That's really cool. I actually really agree with that because um, my best friend, she always like sings completely off key, but she <laughs> sings with so much like love and intention <laughs> that it like makes me so happy. Her voice is one of my favorite voices because she always <laughs> just is so happy to be singing. Um, but I actually had a question about... Um, are there things that you do to kind of like help with songwriting drought, like things that you do that kind of help kickstart things or do you take breaks and do certain other things? Um, well, I, you know, I've had other friends who I feel are fantastic, like some of my favorite writers and, um, Roger would know one of these gentlemen very well. And he would always say to me, he's like, I just can't do it anymore. And I, my approach is always like, just let it, just let it be. Like, if it's not coming to you, just continue to play. Like, you know, like continue to sing, continue to play. Uh, but don't let the focus be like, don't feel like you're failing if you're, if that isn't happening. Uh, if you're not writing, um, there's definitely been times where I just sit down every day um, and spend, you know, however many hours going through different writings, different, like I used to, you know, now I have a phone, but I used to have a tape recorder that I carried everywhere. And so I would just go through these tape cassettes and see what's on them because, you know, and, and see if that would spark any interest, you know, if if I felt like I was a little dry you know, and not writing enough. Um, and, and sometimes you'll even like sit down and be like, I'm going to finish this song that I've been stuck on for the last six months. And sometimes you end up just writing a completely different song and that one still just sits there unfinished. And there's things that I've had that were unfinished that like, you know, I get like, I just couldn't figure out that piece of the puzzle that really made it feel like it was a song. Um, and sometimes I've sat on that stuff for as long as, you know, seven to eight years or longer. Um, like even on the last record, I had a song called A Little Honey on the Night Sweats record that I wrote. I don't even know how long ago that I only had the beginning piano part and like kind of the first verse and it never worked out for like eight years. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, what if I just do this? And then 
like I think I, I, I sometimes I think that the blockage of writing is you just kind of getting in the way of your of yourself, you know. And so my approach is always to just kind of like, just kind of not put too much energy into whether I'm writing or not writing. Um, and when I do start to write, I certainly get excited about it. Like, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, there are a few of us that are on here that are actually from Detroit. We went to like a satellite school of uh, Metro. So, um, did you ever have like that moment where you like hurt, maybe like heard yourself on the radio or something like that? And like, you were like, you know, like that realization that this is playing in like other cities like Detroit and all over. Like, was there ever that moment where you're like, oh, this is it, like it's happening, you know? Cause the first time I heard you was SOB on the radio. Right. So. I, was just I mean, we're, I, I was always blown, you know, I remember like um, touring, opening up for The Fray, which is another Denver band from the 2000s, okay. yeah. back when I was a so, like singer-songwriter. And I remember like while we were on tour with them, going everywhere, like, you know, being at the Bob Evans having breakfast and like being in the bathroom and hearing their song come on. I was like, oh, I can't get away from this. <laughs> and then it started to happen you know, we're not so much excited, but I'd be like at the grocery store and our one of our songs would come on, I'd be like, ah, just, and then people would be like, say you, I was like, yeah, I just, you yeah, it. It. So, <laughs> and so I, I think um, the first few years or the first couple of years, like I was saying earlier, were so intense and I was so surprised that people were listening to it, that any of that stuff was being played I wasn't super concerned or I didn't spend too much time thinking about, I wasn't, I should, I wasn't excited as I would have liked to have been about hearing myself or hearing our songs play. All I was thinking about is like, how do I keep this thing going? You know, that was like, like, how do I keep making this the best I can make this? And like, and uh, yeah, I think that that might've like kind of robbed me of a lot of good experiences, but I, you know, and when I guess at some point, like I have a great band, but I'm the I'm the writer, and so it's like it's still left up to me to figure that shit out, you know. And I'm lucky enough that I have a great group of like a family of musicians around me that are really supportive. Uh, but yeah, sometimes that pressure is the only thing I can see, and I don't really get to enjoy the sweet stuff. So yeah, yeah, but I, I, I feel like I. I get caught up in the pressure too. I mean, it's different for everybody, but even like opportunities to perform, I still get like, well, what if I mess up? And you don't think about right. like, oh, this is a great opportunity. And you just right. kind of get lost in the anxiety of it or the pressure, so. Well, you also, like, it was also hard to know um, sometimes um, when things were happening. Like I remember we were in tour, we happened to be in Germany and we were playing we had gone over there to start with the Night Sweats because I had done better as a solo artist over there um, in the UK and Europe. And so we brought the Night Sweats over there to try to jumpstart and then thought that the excitement would carry over, but it was a lot of like crossed arms. Like people were like, oh, I don't know what this is. This is like, but I love these other songs, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, so we were feeling pretty discouraged and I was like, well, this is the end of my career. I remember my manager calling me and be like, you guys are going to do Fallon. And for years I'd wanted to do any late night shows and never had even as a solo artist. And, um, and so I told the guys, we're like, Oh, fucking cool. I guess like we're so discouraged. We, and we didn't later on know that, that the Fallon show would like be the thing that launched our song and our career. Um, and that was kind of the thing that really, I remember, Jimmy like holding up the record and he liked it so much he kept playing it through the episode. Um, and so by the time we got done, like my, my manager was like, you just sold more pre-sales than you've ever sold any records combined. But we didn't know th how that show was going to impact our career or even that moment of the pre-sales or my, like, you know what I mean? Like there's, it's, it's hard to have any perspective 
in that in that sense you know like yeah. to know how that's going to happen and so um you know you'll always have people that surround them surround you that like kind of try to fill your ear or even blow smoke up your ass that there's a lot of that that kind of sometimes ends up being more discouraging than helpful so yeah thank you so much yeah my pleasure Nathaniel, can you talk a little a little bit about how you negotiate being the main writer with with other folks in the band? Because I mean, some other folks like Joey, for example, is a great songwriter in his own right. And so, how do you negotiate the fact that that you are the main songwriter um, with all of these other pieces? Well, there's never been an actual discussion. Um, I think I just end up like I, I generate a lot of material. Um, I'm always open to ideas like I, on, on the last Night Sweats record, somebody had come to Pat and like I said earlier, Pat and myself both did a lot of commercial work and he got offered to do, basically somebody came to him and was like, we'd like a song that sounds like the Night Sweats, but we can't afford licensing for a Night Sweats song. So Pat starts to write this song, you know, this structure and even has the horn players play on it. And then the commercial people actually turned it down. And then I was also like kind of in a very similar, this happened a lot with like, uh, um, like when Mick Jagger was writing with David Bowie and Keith Richards was like, you can't give that fucking song to David Bowie. That's a fucking hit. It's a stone song, you know? Um, right now I'm trying to remember which, um, it's a huge hit of the stones. It could have been a David Bowie, you know, but it ended up being, so it was just like, oh, here, hold on one second. Um, I ended up like taking that song that, that Pat had sent me. And I was like, I was like, dude, don't, I was like, you can't throw this away. This is awesome. And then, then I just ended up writing lyrics and then Pat and I worked on the structure once I kind of got my hands on it. And yeah, but, it's never really been a discussion. Um, I'm always open to people bringing in songs. Um, and sometimes we work a lot on structure together and then I end up just writing stuff or, um, yeah, you know, I know Joseph sometimes like, um, he'd be like, well, it could be better if you just said this and I'll be like, Oh yeah. And then that'll, instead of taking exactly what he said, I'll find something in between there that, I like a little better, but it kind of gets the cogs going. So, other questions from folks, people who haven't asked anything yet. I'm curious. Uh with what you just said, um, if there's like a difference in uh, between band members, how you split up royalties, like do you get more for doing the songwriting? Um, I do, as the songwriter, you get the majority. Um, and since a lot of the times I write the progression, um, so I've tried to balance that out by like, um, there's a lot of ways to try to do that so people don't feel like they're getting ripped off because it's it's been a long time debate for people who play uh you know i think if you look at like um the guys from motown and the wrecking crew um muscle shoals stacks records like there's you know a lot of this stuff um that you have some of the best players of, of all history for soul and R&B and rock and roll that aren't really credited and don't get royalties. So that's something that's sort of changing um, music law. And so like on the last record, um, like I would go to Luke who studied jazz and I'm like, I'm hung up on this guitar progression and I don't know where to go if I can't figure out where, where the progression needs to go. Uh, and then he, he ended up helping me and then I have to give him a percentage that we'd agreed to, we agreed upon that seemed fair to him 
for helping me write a bridge, which ended up turning out to be uh, the song You Worry Me, which ended up being the, the one of the most played songs off of our last record. So, which benefited him because now he gets royalty checks for it. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had um, like any points of contention with figuring out that rate? Um, no. Like I said, I, I, I try to go out of my way to be. Um, like for the last record um, and for this record, what I did was like um, everyone gets a point off of the record, which is kind of unheard of, even if they don't write um, any words or any progressions. And then on top of that, if there's a structure contributed to it, then we break it down as to you know, how much somebody um, helped write. I always err on the side of giving away a little bit more because uh, in my opinion, you can be the nicest guy in the world but people generally only remember you for being an asshole. So um, they, only, they only pick out the negative things. So I try to um, make it so there's very minimal amounts of that, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you feel pressured to um, produce enough material for the new record, like to keep things in a cycle moving? Yeah, always. Um, yeah, I, I feel like uh, I'm actually just kind of, my, my house has been so chaotic, I'm just going to leave town and like go sleep in my van for a few days. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, but... Uh, the pressure is, is a lot for me. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to, I want to uphold to my own personal standard. And I think there's no outside pressure from anyone else. It's just personal pressure. Um, but I, I mean, if you look in every walk of life of not just creativity, but people that are successful, like how driven are they, you know, like how, like, how crazy are they about the things that they're doing? And I'm, you know, I, I feel like I can be pretty crazy about songwriting in, in a good way, you know? Um, but I, but I feel it's important to really push myself and stretch myself as much as I possibly can. Um, and the results have worked out so far, but yeah, but yeah, I do, you know, I think, um, yeah, it, it, it's like sort of a balance of, um, what I want to do artistically um, that is the pressure, but then also, like I've said a couple of times that just the weight of sustainability financially for everyone as a whole and now their families as well. So that can be a lot. And I don't think I, I have other friends that don't really approach things that way, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to do what I feel is good because of everybody who's been there for me and contributed to my writing and, and playing it live and the hours and, and years and days that they've put their time into, I try to honor that, you know, and sometimes that's in, in the form of finances. So. Yeah, so that, in the last two kind of questions that you answered, that this is like a theme, you seem to be very community minded as a person. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could talk about because we talk about this a lot in class, like that we don't write songs in a vacuum. And so like outside of your band, can you say anything about, you know, you, you said you weren't quite part of the scene that was per existing in Denver when you got here, the warehouse scene and stuff. But like how is community in, in songwriting, either in Denver or abroad or wherever, um, influenced your? Um, well, you know, I think for a long time, the songwriting like as a community was still just kind of always in my head it wasn't until recently that I actually get to like kind of collaborate with other people um I mean well in the past you know I'm sure I would have done stuff with like Joe Sampson and Chris and those kind of people but that was always sort of like 
helping out whatever they were doing, contributing to what they were doing. Um, and not always like sort of a balance, like let's do this together. So um, that's kind of a newer thing for me, trying to figure out like, like wanting to collaborate or write with people or write for people. I've been, I wrote one song um, for Mavis Staples um, that we put out together under the night sweats as a fundraiser. And I have another one that I'm working on for her to do. And I, um, I'd love to continue to do that kind of stuff, but then see those songs like not performed by me, but actually performed on other people's records. But, and there's still, you know, there's like, uh, even when I was working on the song for Mavis, um, I based the whole thing on the new Colossus, which is the poem at the base of the Statue of Liberty because I thought Mavis would be a little sensitive to me being like heavy. The ideas I had were kind of like a little heavy handed against Trump and I didn't want to push her away because I don't really know her beliefs. But I knew that we could all agree on, on you know, what, what I was trying to write about and, and what the new Colossus is talking about is that we should be a sanctuary for people, that this country is a sanctuary. And, um, and just kind of talking about the divide and class issues. Um, <clears throat> and and she was totally on board with all of that. So, yeah. but you never know. And it can be like, I, you know, I, and I guess, uh, yeah, but I sat down and I talked with her about it and talked like what key would she want to do it in? And, and she, yeah, for whatever reason, she calls me Montana. And so she just be like, Oh, Montana, it all sounds good to me. You know, it's like, I'm glad you're writing about it. I was like, all right. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, Ron Miles was in the chat for a while, but he had to go to office hours. But, you know, Mavis Staples is is like his main person. He, I just read an interview of, of Ron's last weekend that I'll share with the class. Yeah, uh, yeah. In Jazz Weekly. So that he'll appreciate <laughs> Um, but that brings up another thing that you and I have talked about, you know, over drinks at different times that is, is the way that your politics or statements that you make about political um, causes, putting a black, you know, covering up your, your face in Facebook or something like that with a black picture um, uh, or just a blacked out picture. Um, how does that... Uh, you know, affect business and affect like um, your audiences. And, and you've talked about times where you've had to people misinterpret SOB. They throw beer on the stage or, right. or, or they don't want you. They don't want to hear your political statements. They just want you to sing. And um. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, it couldn't, you know, I've definitely had some backlash. Um, from people who you know and i we're seeing a lot of that right now because of there's such a divide um for a long time my my goal is really to try to bring people together and not talk too much about my personal views um and you know on religion and politics uh, but just try to talk about greater understanding and love for each other and acceptance and 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 by playing music and bringing people together, you allow people to um, share music together, which is an amazing thing in human experience, I think. Um, and, and sometimes people can come to a show and leave with a different view of just because they had an experience with somebody next to them. And so I try to create an environment that, that sets those situations up, I guess. Um, but at this point in our world, um, it is impossible, in my opinion, um, um, to stay quiet. Um, and I, and I believe we will look back in the future and and look at people who chose to be on a certain side of history. And so I feel like at this point. Even if I lose fans, I, I refuse to to be on you know the wrong side of history. I, I think that um, you know whether it's um, there's so many things right now that uh, are happening in our world that uh, you know whether it's people 
you know, kids being separated from their families and the border. There's uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. There's still LGBTQ stuff, which I have a personal, you know, like all these things that like, I don't know. And, and just like this push, um, I don't know how I say all this. Um, I, I just don't feel that like all of this stuff coming up that like, um, when people are just so hungry to be accepted as and, and, and deserve to be treated like humans. And, and I think that's what the focus should be. And, and we're not allowing people, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, democracy, um, sorry, capitalism doesn't allow people to all equally share in a human experience. It only lends itself to um, an upper tier of the system. And we're seeing this sort of global capitalism um, <clears throat> kind of corrupt everything and even corrupt people's, you know, be because there's so much uh, misinformation, it's, it's easy to trick a lot of people who really, you know, the whole, the idea of divide and conquer, which is something that I talked to Mavis about when I was writing that song, um, has been the, the founding principle of our country and capitalism. So, so it's hard to not talk about those things. Um, and I feel like uh, I'm doing a disservice to, um, to the people who are in need if I don't say anything. So that means that I don't get asked back to play certain places and people don't buy my records. I've straight, you know, in social media, I, people were being negative. I just block them. Um, I remember some, I said something to somebody um, where I was just like, I was like, your comment does nothing for any, you know, it's not constructive, it's not intelligent, and it's not helpful in any ways. You know, it's not, it's not even a real argument. So, I, you know, I was just like, feel free to not buy my records and to not come to my shows. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> if you're going to take a hard stance and you're only going to spread hatred and have no understanding. Uh, and I think that's the thing. There was like, we, we lack understanding for things that are different from us. And, um, but I think our system is based on continuing to push those things that we feel uncomfortable about or don't understand um, instead of creating uh, places where we can have conversation and that are neutral. Um, it only has become one, you know, two sides really. Um, and, and, and so I feel like with this sort of, the two side uh, dilemma, we, you know, you're, you're never really going to uh, really understand the person um, that you're feeling uncomfortable about or that you don't like, or, yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, my name is Donatella. Um, so kind of piggybacking off of what you were just talking about, um, do you think that it's important in general for musicians to express their political views um, so kind of like their followers know more than just their music, kind of that separation between the artist and their personality, you know, their music and themselves. Do you think that it's important for artists to share their political views or do you think that musicians should just focus on the music and making their own music, whatever that may be? Um, I, I think it, it really depends on the time. I feel like right now is a time where uh, it is very important um, to be vocal about, um, I guess, what you align yourself with. Um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of other friends do it as well. You know, um, uh, Tyler Childress, Sturgill Simpson, Margo Price, um, you know, who are all kind of in a world of country music where um, you know, stinks to make the broad generalization, but a lot of fans of country music are pretty conservative and, um, and now, you know, conservatism is also feels like something that we're fighting against. Um, yeah. So I, I do feel it's important. Uh, and also, you know, I, I feel all art form is, is sort of the mirror of what is happening and, in in our time and in all times and so or it should be the reflection of what is happening socially 
Um, and so, yeah, that's, um, it, it's hard to um, not reflect what's happening right now um, right. because we've never, we haven't really seen this sort of, um, sort of rise in a long time, so. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying all that stuff, Nathaniel. That really, it means a lot when I see artists um, speaking up about things that are happening in the world. And, um, you know, it's like, I don't think the human race is dumb. <laughs> Sometimes it's questionable, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that the human race, the human race knows what is bad. And we can identify evil and we've done it for a very long time. And I just feel like, I don't know, like we, we know right from wrong. And so just speaking up about it and mentioning it and talking about it is really, um, I just appreciate it a lot. So thank you for talking. Yeah, about of course. I, was like, I was like listening to you and like, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like I love the fact that he's talking about this right now. Like this is such a, it's a big deal. It'd be crazy not to talk about it. Um, kind of switching gears a tiny bit away from um, the, that topic. I wanted to ask you about um, creating like a body of work, like an album. Um, how do you ensure that the album, that the songs in the album will be connected? Or is that something that you don't really pay attention to or don't really worry about? Um, well, a lot of times I just, you know, the theme of the album doesn't really present itself at first. Uh, my approach has always been to write a lot and throw as much at the wall as I can and see what sticks. Um, I feel like with the record I'm working on right now, um, I, I am kind of approaching it slightly different where I do have, I, I'm not necessarily a theme about what I'm talking about, but like um, vibe and style is something that I'm going for on this that, um, but I know there's a couple of things that are just straight up curveballs already. Um, <clears throat> There's one song that uh, I think it's called "The Slow Pace of Time" is the t is the working title, um, which would sound very different from everything else that I have on the record. Um, a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of the stuff that I've been working on kind of has sort of like a more Bill Withers like kind of mid tempo groove, um, and this song is sounds more like a you know it's a pretty heavy handed guitar progression that would lend itself to sort of like a New Orleans style, Sidney Bichet, um, yeah, sax and clarinet sort of vibe. So very, yeah, pretty different. So. so this is kind of the first time that you've like, well, and you said not really theme, but like decided on like a kind of, I would say like a vibe maybe that you're aiming for. Yeah, exactly. Like I, there's just like kind of a, a group of songs that I, they just kind of all feel a certain way. And so I feel like a, a majority of the record will have that kind of feel, but I don't know if all of it will. I feel like some of it will kind of, there's some songs that I want to work on that, yeah, like I said, there's things that kind of come out of nowhere too in the middle of the writing in the record, like recording process. Um, you know, uh, for example, the last record that I put out, the solo record, and it's still all right, the title track, I didn't even have going into the studio. It was like a loose idea and I wrote it um, over coffee at breakfast one morning before we went in the studio and then went in and recorded it that day and it ended up becoming the title track and the hit off the record. So, you know, there's always those kind of scenarios where um, the songs surprise you and they just kind of come out of whatever, so, yeah. Is there any advice you would give to someone who's looking to create kind of a body of work? Not like, I wouldn't say, and I'm, of course, I'm talking about myself. I'm not talking about like a big, too big of a body of work, kind of like an EP. Is there any advice that you could give about um, just either musically or um, I the way that you write? Um, you mentioned that you kind of just like, you play the chords, you play um, what you're working with, and then you kind of sing and like... Um, you said something train of thought or stream well, of consciousness. Stream of consciousness, yeah. Um, so um, that's that's actually um, a very common method that I use when I'm making music. I just kind of like 
sit there and listen and just kind of like spew it like i just word vomit you know um or melody and mm-hmm. lyric vomit um but is there any advice that you would give to someone who's um attempting to create a body of work um yeah well i mean i guess it all depends on the approach which is kind of what we're talking about because i i've certainly written some things where i had like a back in my earlier days of writing with my old band born in the flood sometimes i would have like a title for the record and i would write to that like the title would sometimes be um totally different than any there was like you know no track on the record that would that was that title and so then that would be kind of my theme uh, like one of them was called the fear that we may not be and so then i was like kind of i guess that might have been relationship based but still um you know i kind of all those songs ended up being about the certain situation i was in at the time um another you know if you have a song you write that you feel is really strong that can be your anchor as well and you sort of um not mimic that song but think of the structure of that song and like start to think about like what could you write that would accompany that well because i still think of it even though music is listened to in different formats um i still like the idea of like a, a vinyl record you have a side a and a side b so um so even if you're making an ep let's say you have three songs on each side what are you going to do to get people to like turn the record over after those three songs or five songs and when they get to the other side and it ends what are you going to end with for them to want to start it over again and so then even even though the records themselves that i'm making um the songs don't have much continuity sometimes you start to kind of have an idea i feel like the songs sort of reveal themselves to you like I guess what the playlist would be, what the track listing would be. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, I know that's a lot of, that's a lot of information, but it, it, but it's really like, yeah, either come up with a theme that you like or like use, use a song you really like to anchor around it. That's what we, I would, I guess that's the short answer. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. We're getting kind of towards the end of our time. We've only got a a few more minutes, but um, so at the beginning of the semester, Nathaniel, Lisa Gedgaudis was the first person who came in and we started this conversation about like, you know, what are we doing under COVID and um, how how do we sustain ourselves, but also um, these inequities that we, that keep coming up in conversations um, and, and the opportunities that we might have like on the flip side of COVID or whatever it looks like in the future. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if you have had thoughts or, you know, you've played big venues and small venues. Um, You've mentioned this stuff about capitalism and the way that it, you know, sort of manifests inequity. Um, uh, If you had thoughts about that, I know that you, you have the foundation um, things. So I wonder if you could talk about that and like ways that music sort of gives back or might be more equitably focused in the future. Yeah, I mean, um, kind of early on, we got lucky enough to kind of um, be involved with Farm Aid. And, you know, kind of growing up in rural Missouri, it, it was just evident to me even going back and visiting when you see so much produce grown, but not also in the proper way. Like nobody knows what what we're seeing it now that like there's no microorganisms in our soil because we, we don't rotate crops. We don't grow cover crops. And then we pump the soil full of nitrogen so we can grow subsidized corn, which, you know, which isn't really that, that good of a crop for everyone to digest. Um, and then that nitrogen leaches into our water table, which then starts to grow too much algae in our fresh water that also, uh, interferes with, 
fish. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I guess Farm Aid uh, was something that was like so familiar to me from growing up in rural Missouri. Uh, and and then going there and then starting to learn about um, things that are happening in urban communities, um, you know, and then like how to like how to grow how to grow food in a small community that can make it into a school district or into your community and like the troubles of that. Uh, and then seeing how that relates to still like, um, you know, like seeing how people are still living where I grew up and how people were living in Denver and, um, and just starting to see like, well, there's not enough being done. There's not enough being done about Western water conservation and, you know, and, you know, I, I've been friends with John Hickenlooper for years, and um, I, I don't agree with, uh, you know, I always jokingly call him Frackenlooper. <laughs> I was like, John, that's, that's drinking water we're using, man, you know, and uh, I mean, I hope he, he uh, wins the Senate race against Cory Gardner, but um, I, I guess in my way of giving back, you know, especially with starting the foundation, um, it, you know, the Marable Project's it, the Marigold Project is set up to um, work on um, social, economic, and racial justice. Um, and so there's so much being done there. It's been hard to focus on one thing, um, you know, but I, Carrie Knott, who runs the foundation who we met through Farm Aid, um, uh, Carolyn, uh, who runs Farm Aid, uh, is Carrie's mentor. So she's kind of worked in that field for a long time. And, you know, basically I just come to her and I'll be like, well, you know, how do, how do we get more instruments in the school districts? How do we, uh, what's happening in native communities around Colorado? Uh, you know, how do we, you know, and I, I think the important thing is to not come in with a solution to fix things that you see, mm -hmm. but to insert yourself into um, you know, in, into different parts of our community and ask what people need and then see, like, ask them what the problems are um, and, and ask them what they think the solutions are and, and then try to work, you know, like try to work on solving that based on what they think they really need or what they feel they need. Um, and so we try to do that. So really it's kind of been everything from, uh, advocating for gun legislation change which we helped pass the red flag bill law um which was you know like some of my my band members like speaking on the floor um yeah you know and so it's uh, and that was a dangerous thing to align myself with too because i know there's a lot of people who are uh you know very guns are a very sensitive topic and since i grew up in the midwest it's like and grew up hunting um uh, and, and I'm a gun owner. I was like, how do we have a conversation with people who do own guns, but do we need assault rifles? And how do we keep them out of schools? And how do we keep them out of our communities? And how do we keep kids safe? And, you know, and focused on learning and education and the experience of, you know, the social experience of humanity at a young age in school and not be them being learned to do active shooter drills with a red button on a desk, you know, like how do we eliminate that and make the focus in school, um, that thing that is kind of awkward, but important, but learning how to be a human, you know, so, so kind of all over the place. So it's been that we'll do a lot of stuff with the unhoused in Colorado. Um, yeah, there's just kind of no end to the work that can be done. Um, you know, even though I said earlier that I kind of remove myself from a lot of religious beliefs, I still uh, admire some of the work that some of the churches do. And uh, when our ideas about a community align, we are there to help back them up when they're doing good things. So like Scum of the Earth has always had a very good program. Um, to feed people who are living on the streets and we have such a big problem with that right now um, you know so but then it's really like on a bigger level like how do we how do we get um local government to see that that many people living on the streets is actually in the long run 
going to slowly um, bleed money out of the, the the system for the state and that building housing and building sanitary areas uh, will keep people out of the hospitals and then you know yeah so like how do how does how does how does um, people not having homes affect the local economy you know how does not having art affect the local economy so we try to be ad you know advocate for those sort of things and see change there as well great <laughs> um we're it's twelve thirty three. so unless somebody has like a burning question i, I i'll say anybody have a burning question <laughs> oh. i wanted to ask one more thing if that's okay sure um I just wanted to see if you had any advice for um, for getting your music out there, like um, just getting it noticed or like, I know when you're talking to Devin, you kind of was just like, it was luck. <laughs> so, um, but um, is there any advice like, or any thoughts you have about now since like we're all closed in and there's not really any live shows going on? Um, boy, I don't know. Um... It's very difficult. I, I think, you know, um, I just continue to write, um, you know, continue to discover what excites you about your instrument um, and even learn more if you can. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a hard time to really put yourself out there and to get recognized. So um, yeah, because it, it's hard for me to do Zoom calls even so. <laughs> you know, and for people and to have an audience. So um yeah. Thanks. I guess I guess just keep plugging away. I know that sounds a little discouraging, but uh um I, I you know, the work pays off in the long run. So and, and really, you know, I had like so many years where nobody really gave a shit about what I was doing, but I still do the work and it, you really have to do the work for the love of the work and, and not that you'll be able to get you know, not that people recognize it, but like how much joy does it bring in, you know? And kind of what, kind of what you said too about serving the song and not um, not always being self-serving, you know? So it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, we'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time, Nathaniel. Uh, you bet, Roger. Love you, bud, and I'll talk to you soon. Love you yeah. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thanks, Take it easy. Be well, everyone. See you. And leave this.